Hi, I am an extremely average man. In last video, we touched on four main reasons why you would chamber an AR-15 in 7.62x39. Uh, why create the AR-47 in the first place? In that video, I came up with four main reasons. Reason number one being uh, cost of ammo here in 2022, soon to be 23. 762 by 39 it's still cheaper, although the, the margins are narrowing, but it's still cheaper than 556. Reason number two, if you're like me and you're, you're coming from owning an SKS or an AK-47 AKM pattern rifle first, um, you can also build these out for 762 by 39 and thus you don't have to stockpile a bunch of 556 as well. So commonality of caliber. Third reason being uh, you can hunt with this in many places. Again, check your, check your local uh, state, county rules and regulations on, on hunting. But since it is a 30 cal, it makes a great platform for that if, if your state or county allows. And I know in Texas, you guys have a, a feral hog swine problem. This makes an excellent rifle for that. Fourth reason, and huge for me and for many of us, it's just fun. It's, I, I get a, a big joy shooting the, the by 39 round, round out, of, out of both these rifles. And I thought of another reason in, in the meantime, since making that video. Uh, fifth reason being that since it's an AR and tolerance is a little bit tighter, and on both these I do have heavy barrels, pros and cons to, to having a heavy barrel. However, you get accuracy with that. So these are very accurate rifles also. If you can see behind, me, but that was a five round group. Again, I'm an average shooter. That was off of a bench at 50 yards, just zeroing in the uh, LPBO. That's pretty good. That's about, I haven't really measured it to be honest, but uh, one and a half MOA. I mean, if I were on a lead sled or something, that, that's easy, one MOA. So, okay, so, so now we'll address the elephant in the room. This is the, the big Achilles heel on these builds. It's the, the main reason why people generally won't have this as their, their primary or duty rifle. It's the reason why it scares a lot of people off on this build uh, as it is. And it's just by design. Um, as we all know, the AR-15 was built around the 5.56 caliber round. And in order to chamber that in 7.62 by 39, what you have to do since it's a bigger diameter bullet that you're putting, putting in the AR. In order to make it fit, what, you, what, what manufacturers have to do is actually hollow out the bolt, so remove material from the bolt, as well as the extractor, to accommodate the, the wider diameter of the, the by 39 casing. And in doing so, it, it's already a wear item on, on normal ARs, 5.56. And now you're telling it to, to fire a larger, larger round, and you're also removing material. I mean, it's just kind of a recipe for, yes, your bolt and extractor are, are going to wear much faster. Now, just to further the point, here is a stripped 762 by 39 bolt. You can see how, just how hollow the, the walls in between the lugs truly are. And I, I apologize, I don't have a 556 bolt, otherwise this would make a, a great comparison, but... If you do have a 5.56, you know that's that's clearly clearly been pretty hollowed out to accommodate for the the 7.62 by 39 round. And there's a, there's an extractor. And here's yet again a complete bolt, a little bit dirty, but you get the point. Mileage is going to vary. Um, don't quote me on this. I'm just going to give you guys ballpark figures. Steel cased ammunition um, on your extractor, just plan on about a thousand to fifteen hundred rounds before your extractor is going to break. And this is on like an enhanced extractor. Enhanced, we'll get to that later. On your bolt, I would say maybe around five thousand rounds. Um, I primarily only shoot bellum brass case through my ARs, and I'll, I'll touch on that later too. But I have found brass is just the most reliable. These rifles shoot this stuff no problem. Personally, I have about through just over 3,000 rounds on, on this guy with the red dot. My extractor, and, and shooting brass is going to be a little bit nicer on your extractors. You know, brass is just, it's a softer metal. Um, steel is, is coarser, it's, it's tougher, 
it's, it's going to wear your Trekker out quicker. Now on brass, I would say maybe somewhere from 3,000 to 5,000 rounds for your extractor. Five to 6,500, again, ballpark figure on, on your bolt. Uh, but just know those are wear items and much more on an on a AR-47. So when you go to the range, just know that. It, I mean, I keep spares. <laughs> I would upgrade to like a small case. This is a little Pelican case. And I have three spare extractors in here. I have two spare firing pins, a spare bolt, and I got a couple other little shooting things. But but just know, you know, you're, you're gonna be going through extractors. For a lot of people, that's a that's a huge turnoff, and you know, I can fully understand why you wouldn't want it. When your life depends on it, why you wouldn't want uh, you know something that's kind of a ticking time bomb. However, if you shoot just steel case, a lot of people see that as a cost savings, you know? Well, okay, after 1,500 rounds, if I have to replace the extractor, however, I'm saving 40, 50 bucks on a, you know, on a thousand round case of ammo every time I order, you know, what's a, what's a $20 extractor? So that's up to you on, on what you want to do there. Now, you can get these rifles to run reliably, and both these do. You just have to be aware of the limitations of the bolt and the extractor. That being said, there, there's a few, some of these run fine out of the box, but for most of us, there's gonna be a couple little gremlins, and I'm gonna say about three or four trouble spots, or spots where you need to spend a little bit more time and money to get quality parts and, and know how to mitigate. And that's the whole point of this video. Um, if you're just coming over and you, you want to build an AR in the 7.62x39, but you, you don't know where to start, this, I want to make this a blueprint to, to help guide you on your journey of, of building this in, in by 39 Now, I am not the end-all, be-all expert on, on, on mitigating every single problem there is. I've built two that run reliably, and I have encountered... Most of the gremlins, uh, most of the little trouble areas, and I want to I want to help encourage others, and I want this video to be a blueprint on if you're just getting into building this in the 7.62x39, areas to look for, to look out for, and areas to spend a little bit more money on, on quality parts and how to mitigate some of the some of the little teething issues that can come up. So yeah, please be friendly in the comments, and um, you know I'm, I'm trying to build a community on this. So uh, let's let's help each other out and enjoy the rest of the video. And I, I really hope this does help you guys who are looking to to build uh, a 762 by 39 and and build it reliably. Because once you do that, man, these things are a lot of fun. Now I should mention before we get too far into the video that everything I'm about to explain is based off of an AR with a 16 inch barrel and a carbine length gas system. Now, when, when, you, when I start talking about the gas system, shorter barrels are still gonna apply, but um, balance, balancing or tuning the gas system might be a little bit different. Um, we're not gonna talk about suppressors in this video, and this video is also not gonna apply to the PSA KS-47 or piston uppers, such as like a BRN-180 upper. Now, it's worth mentioning, and in case you didn't know, the only parts on an AR that need to be 762 by 39 specific, besides your magazines, is going to be the upper receiver. So make sure your barrel, your compensator, if you have one, or your muzzle device, and the parts in your bolt carrier group are all 762 by 39 uh, caliber specific. When it comes to the lower receiver, just make sure somewhere in the description, if you're looking online, or on the receiver itself, it says multi-caliber. That way, you know it'll, it'll accept other calibers, such as 7.62x39. I hope this is in frame. Welcome to my garage floor. I figured this would be a good way to show kind of a diagram of those three areas you need to focus on. Plus, who doesn't have a bunch of cardboard laying around between Amazon Prime and Chewy boxes? 
Now, the magazine selection for the AR-47 is rather limited compared to other firearms, but there is one magazine that is the gold standard um, that I have personal experience with and many others do as well, and I have not heard a single feeding issue with this type of magazine, and I can, I can attest to that as well. I've put thousands of rounds through my AR um, and have not had a single feeding issue, and these are just excellent magazines. So bar none, I'm going to recommend, here let's just, if you know the magazine, let's just say it on three. One, two, three, Duramags. Sea Products Defense Duramags. Now, I have heard of people running ASC magazines, but even with those, I've heard of um, several people still having feeding issues. So bar none, I'm going to recommend the Sea Products Defense Duramag. And they come in, I believe, 10, 20, 28, and 30 rounders. Um, I started with the 30 rounders, and then I kind of switched to 28, and this is just kind of a personal preference. Um, and I think the reason why a lot of people run 28 rounders is it just looks the cleanest. There's a 28 rounder right there. Here's a, here's a 30 rounder. It just looks kind of elongated and funky. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people complain about the curved mag on the AR-47 anyway, but I think the 28 rounder is kind of the best of both worlds for capacity as well as, as looks. Now, the second area you need to focus on on your AR-47 to have it run reliably as well as for longevity is number two. It's going to be your bolt carrier group, and there's three items within your BCG. You're going to have to focus and spend a little bit more money on a good bolt, good firing pin, and a good extractor. And when you go to, to do your homework on these and figure out which ones you want, you're going to see this term enhanced. Enhanced bolt, enhanced firing pin, enhanced extractor. Well, what the hell does that mean? And largely, I think it's a marketing term. Um, the word enhanced, and we'll, we'll touch on this. Uh, it's it's going to mean it's better than a mil spec in some form or another. Now, with your enhanced bolt, expect to pay anywhere from about eighty to one hundred bucks for your nice Gucci bolt. Now, with that, at the at the very least, it should be material particle inspected. Many are also high pressure tested, and they're usually made of a higher grade steel. Now, I'm not a metallurgist, and I I wrote out some grades of steel here. Look, I'm not even going to pretend to know the, the grades of these. Just know, oh, there goes, my, there goes my pointer. Just know that it's going to be a higher grade steel that's usually treated at a much higher temperature, say 1,000 plus degrees. Um, machining tolerances are also going to be tighter, and quality control overall is going to be better on, on a higher end bolt. And with the 7.62x39 bolt, um, you want to look for a 0.125 inch recess. And that's going to be kind of the same with the extractor as well. Um, these are typically labeled as like a type 1. Um, and with a higher end bolt, you'll also get some kind of corrosion, wear resistance, uh, such as a nitride or, or phosphate slash parkerized coating. And some brands to, to look at, uh, some companies, Black Rifle Arms, that's what I run in both of mine. Um, that's an excellent company. You're going to be paying, I think, about 85 bucks for, for a good bolt. Uh, mine, you know, on, on this AR, has about 32, maybe 3,000 rounds through it, and it's, it's doing just fine. Uh, CAC Industries is, a, is another one I've heard people swear by, uh, K-A-K Industries. Um, I found another company, Right to Bear. Um, it looks like they have a sale. I mean, it's about half the price of a BRA. Um, I don't know anything about this company, and I'm, I'm not going to recommend them, but I will put them on there for you guys to do your research. They got really good reviews, so um, I'm curious to see um, if you guys have experience with that. Uh, you know, please share it below, because um, <laughs> yeah, if it's half the price and of equal quality, I'm, I'm all about that. Now, if you're having a lot of light strikes, an enhanced firing pin is the way to go. What makes it enhanced? Well, that means that the tip actually protrudes a little bit further than would be a mil-spec uh, firing pin. And this really helps if you're shooting a lot of steel-cased ammo, um, as well as a lot of comblock stuff. The primers tend to be pretty tough, so an enhanced firing pin is going to be your friend. 
Uh, typically, it's a, again, a harder steel as well. Uh, mine's a stainless steel, I believe. Yeah, it was bolt, bought in conjunction with uh, the Black Rifle Arms bolt and firing pin. I got them as a combo deal. Saved me a little bit of money. So that's, that's a good way to go, too, for a really solid bolt in, in firing pin. That's typically going to run you, I put 10 to 12, eh, probably 10 to 15 bucks, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, brands to really look for here, again, Black Rifle Arms. Also, Red X, Red X Arms. I don't have experience with them, but I've read plenty of reviews and, and have seen their company promoted quite a bit. So maybe check them out as well. Now with your enhanced extractor, just like everything else, make sure it's for 762 by 39 This is going to run you about 20 bucks for a good one. Um, it's going to be typically some kind of hardened steel over mill spec. Um, and with your bolt, make sure it's for a .125 inch recess. Um, and typically it's going to have either a phosphate or nitride protective coating. Um, this is where I'm a little bit confused. Again, because I don't know metallurgy very well. Um, so I have Sanders Armory as my extractors. And this is a really good company. Check them out. Um, they claim that nitride, nitriding, uh, the steel makes it more brittle. So, I mean, they're... That's why they claim they phosphate's better. I don't know. I, I've seen extractors made in nitriding. Um, man, if someone could answer that in the comments, that would, uh, that would benefit us all, because I, I really don't know. Um, all my online research, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't factor if one was better than the other. But anyway, it should have some kind of protective coating. Um, companies to, to look at for extractors. Um, right to bear, again. Um, they have extractors for about 10 bucks, which, you know, they slashed the price and claimed it was a sale. So I don't know. Um, again, if someone can answer if, if they're a quality company, they seem to have really good reviews. But, you know, I don't know if those are bought and paid for reviews. Uh, again, Black Rifle Arms. I mean, they're just a solid company overall. They make really, really quality stuff. Uh, Sanders Armory, that's what I use. And this extractor has about 3,000 rounds on it. So I can attest uh, they work. And then CAC Industries again, K-A-K -K Industries. They make some quality stuff too. Now your bolt, firing pin, and extractor are the three items you should be spending a little bit of money on in order to get reliability and longevity out of your bolt carrier group. Now your bolt carrier itself, I don't think is as important. Just make sure your keys are staked well on it. Um, I'm actually running the stock, this is the stock Bear Creek Arsenal uh, bolt carrier. And I'm running it because, well, for one, I think it's proprietary to the, to the side charge upper. And Bear Creek doesn't make any spares as of yet. However, I am running the Black Rifle Arms Bolt, Black Rifle Arms Firing Pin, and Sanders Armory Extractors. And I've uh, been going about 3,000 rounds on, I think, all three of those items. And uh, it's been very reliable for me, so... The next important part in getting your AR-47 to run reliably and to run well is actually a combination. It's going to be a combo of your gas block and your buffer. Now you might be lucky and your AR-47 might run perfectly right out of the box, but that's not going to be the case for most of us. Most of the time, and this is most builds, your rifle is going to be over-gassed and the more, when you, when you think about it, it makes sense. Just because a rifle is gassed correctly at the factory, which is in one part of the country, it very may well be under gas in another part of the country that it gets sent out to. And with an under gas gun, it's not going to perform. You're going to have feeding issues, you're going to have extraction issues. And if your rifle right out of the box is already having issues, then... People are going to send it back to the factory, which is a waste of time, which is a waste of money. People are going to complain, which is going to hurt the reputation. So to combat that in combating all the other factors, being elevation, being climate, being temperature, being different ammo types that people are going to be running through these guns, in order for them to function right out of the box and for them to keep their reputation, and when money's on the line, they, they have to run. So because of that, many, many companies overgas their rifles. Now with a gas block and a buffer, this is where we're getting into tuning a rifle. You might hear that term thrown around. How to tune a rifle? Well, it's a combination of the gas block and the buffer weight. 
And right out of the bat, if you buy a gun from the factory or if you buy like a complete lower, most of the time it's going to have, uh, here's my little scale, light, heavier. Most of the time it's going to come with the lightest buffer being a carbine weight, the little C right there, carbine weight buffer. And for AR-47s, just in general, that's going to be too light. And the weight, it, it's a little weight that goes in with your buffer spring and it combats it's a, it's a weight that counteracts the, the bolt coming back and going back forward. Um, so right out of the box, I would just recommend getting an H2. That's probably the most common in these builds. I would at least just start with an H2. Um, if you need to go heavier, you can always go an H3. But H2 is probably the most common in these builds. Now with your buffer weight selected, you might have perfect ejection now, but likely you're, you're close. And it could be fine-tuned a little bit further. And this is where our adjustable gas block finishes us off. So if you're, say, 80% in the ballpark of where your gun should be ejecting, adjustable gas block will get you the, the remaining 20% there. And this will allow you to, between the buffer weight and adjusting the gas for perfect ejection, it'll also get you perfect harmonics, and it'll, it'll, it'll get you that feeling that your rifle is balanced. Now, if you have, or if you buy a fixed gas block, and you just adjust your buffer weights, can you get perfect ejection? Well, you can, and many people do. However, if you, say, start with an H2 and it's not functioning, so you bump it up to an H3, or you go down to an H1 and it's still not, not ejecting where it should be, you're kind of stuck because you've tried all the buffer weights and you're still quite not there, and... You have a fixed gas block, so you, you can't adjust on that end. So, again, another good reason to have an adjustable gas block. Now, on the other side of things, say you just keep your carbine buffer weight, but you want to just use your adjustable gas block to, to fine-tune the rifle. You can do that also, just kind of block off the, the gas block um, further than you would. However, I, I truly do think that these rifles function best on an H2 or, or thereabouts with an adjustable gas block. And the benefit of being able to adjust it, um, you know, if you shoot in the wintertime and it, it cycles a little bit different in the summertime or if you go to a different elevation or you take it cross country and go shoot at your uncle's house in Florida or something, um, I, I, I truly do think you guys should should get an adjustable gas block because it really is pretty easy to install and to use. Now there's a couple I would recommend. In both of my builds I have the Aero adjustable gas block which is about 50 bucks and a lot of people swear by superlative arms. They make some quality products. Um, it's like twice the price. It's usually about a hundred bucks on like Optics Planet and some other places. Um, but I hear it's excellent quality, and I have not heard a complaint using superlative arms. Now with buffer weights, since it's not exactly a critical component, I mean, it's, it's just a weight. I don't really, I mean, you can really go with whatever company. I'm pretty sure they're going to they're, they're gonna be okay. Uh, buffer weight in general uh, is going to run you about 30 bucks. I've got an Aero Precision Buffer weight also that I, I think I paid about 30 bucks, maybe 25. May have, may have got it on sale, can't remember. And speaking of ejection, your casing should be ejecting, if you're looking at a clock face, about 3 to 4.30. And if you're unfamiliar with this, let me roll in this footage. Now, the easiest way to represent how a rifle is gassed is to see where it's ejecting based off the face of a clock, which I have right here. When you're at the range, um, I, and I strongly suggest an outdoor range because you're going to need about 15 to 20 feet of unobstruction on your wherever your ejecting side is. Um, I have the clock set up here for like a right side ejecting AR, which mine is. Um, if, if yours is left side ejecting, take this half right here and just kind of mirror it onto the side that says NA. But again, I'm, I'm going to go run through this demonstration based off of a right side ejecting AR. Now with your ejection port at the center of your clock face, let's go over where your casings are landing. Now if they're landing from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in this area right here, you're going to be overgassed. And when you're overgassed, your, your firearm is likely to run 
but it's not going to be running very well. Um, essentially, with an over gas gun, your bolt carrier group is slamming back and slamming forward faster and with more gas than, than what it should be. And that's going to wear out uh, parts in your bolt carrier group much faster, especially your extractor. And you're also going to experience more felt recoil. Now, on the flip side to an over gas gun, if your casings are landing from 4.30 to about 6 o'clock in this area, whoop, your, your gun's going to be under gassed. And essentially, your bolt carrier group isn't coming back far enough. So you're, you're going to be experiencing either um, poor ejection, if it's ejecting at all, uh, feeding issues, it might not even load the next round, or you're going to be experiencing both of those issues. Now, the sweet spot, and this is where you want to be. On a clock face, you want to be ejecting 3 o'clock to 4.30. This is your, this is your perfect ejection, ejection uh, area. Now, if you have a right side ejecting gun and somehow your casings are going over here, man, I don't know what to tell you. Maybe you have a side charge and it's, the casing is hitting this and skipping over here, but again, it, your, your firearm should not be ejecting on this side if it's a, if it's a right side ejector like most ARs. Focus on this area. Now, a few more somewhat common issues that can occur. Um, if you're still having feeding issues, um, a lot of times, this is especially true of, of cheaper barrels. This is one of the cost-saving measures they do. Um, if your feed ramps are kind of gritty, uh, what you can do is take a Dremel with a polishing bit and polish up your feed ramps. That can help you... Uh, that can help the, the rounds load in a lot easier without, uh, th without getting caught up on the feed ramps. Also, if you're still having light strikes, even, even with an enhanced firing pin, um, try a Wolf Extra Power Hammer Spring. Um, and that's for more of a traditional spring. Um, I have like one of those drop-in cassette styles, so it won't really apply there. But if you have more of a standard spring, um, that should help with light strikes. Now, if you're still having extraction issues, um, it could be that your extractor, there's not enough tension on it, and it's not, it's not grabbing the rim of the cartridge and extract, extracting reliably. So, uh, it's pretty cheap, but try an extractor spring slash O-ring kit. I know BCM makes a very quality one. Um, I think they have like a three-pack that you can buy for like 10 bucks. Um, but try that. That might be able to help you out with extraction. Now, I hope this helps you out. I hope this di diagram makes sense. I know there's words kind of all over the place, but feel free to take a screenshot of this, uh, hang this on your fridge. I don't know. <laughs> Do as you will, but um, I hope this helped you out. So I know I haven't covered every single issue that exists, but if you focus on those three main areas, being the bulk carrier group, being the gas system, and being the magazines, that should get you most of the way there. Um, these are the most common, most frequent questions that I get on Reddit, on Facebook, and some other groups that I help people out in. So focus on those three main areas, and that, that should get you most of the way there. And maybe you're still having kind of a, a little teething issue somewhere. Uh, go ahead and post it down below. Maybe we can all help you out. Now, ammunition is, is another area to consider. Uh, besides just a rifle, um, getting reliable ammunition is, is also pretty essential. Now, with the AR-47s, I've kind of had bad luck with steel. You know, maybe some other people could, could help, help you out if you're having steel issues. Um, you're shooting Wolf and Tula, you know, cheap stuff. Uh, I was getting a lot of, uh, I had a mortar charge quite a bit, just getting stuck casings. Um, I kind of switched the brass and kind of stayed there since, just because it's, it's reliable. And, and like, like I've mentioned uh, earlier in the video, um, it's just nicer on your internal parts. Um, I shoot, I've tried Norma, I haven't, Norma's like hit or miss. Uh, I was getting a lot of stuck casings, I had a mortar clear, I think I went through a box of 20, I had a mortar clear four times, and then I was, I just had feeding issues with it. I don't know if it's a difference in tolerances, um, but I shoot Bellum, pretty much solely Bellum, uh, brass case, you can get this stuff on ammo seek anywhere from 40 to 45 cents, so I've, I've kind of stuck with this, and uh, I, I kind of like sticking with one grain just because I'm, you know, I zeroed my LPVO uh, as well as my red dot on 120, 
123 grain and I like to just kind of be consistent but you don't have to do that you can buy cheap cheap stuff if you like and and just shoot it because that's a big reason why people go to this platform anyway um, yeah I just haven't had the greatest luck with steel I know some people do um, you know maybe that's on me maybe I should figure out what the heck's going on shooting steel through these but um, yeah that being said ammo sel selection is uh, another big big factor in making these run reliable reliably now there's a few other things um, to consider when you're when you're building these out, and I didn't include them in earlier in the video because they're they're not as crucial when it comes to uh, reliability, but they are they are pretty critical in overall feel and function of your gun. Um, and that being the first one being the barrel, um, but just about any 7.62x39 barrel is going to work just fine. However, the price point of barrels generally reflects on on how nice of a barrel it is. Um, being accuracy, being weight. <laughs> uh, both of these rifles have uh, just the standard heavy barrel Bear Creek Arsenal in them. And they're good barrels, they're accurate because they're, they're so dang heavy. Um, and with barrel harmonics and all that, you know, they're, they're so dang heavy and chunky that they don't flex or fluctuate much. And they are accurate. However, they are heavy. And especially with this one with the LPVO. Uh, I mean, this gun is about nine and a half pounds. So I... I will probably be upgrading to the, the Faxon Heavy Barrel. Um, I hear they are excellent barrels, uh, one of the best for these builds. And just looking at the, the weight savings alone, I'll be saving about three quarters of a pound coming from these heavy barrels. So barrel is definitely something to consider, but again, not crucial to, to reliability and functionality. Uh, other areas, um, trigger, you know, it's, it's an AR, there's limitless trigger options. I think I've got the, the Rave 140, which people, it's kind of hit or miss. Uh, they run just fine in, in both of my builds. And also your furniture, being your stock, your grip, um, and your, your foregrip as well. Uh, you know, not crucial to function of the firearm, but I think it's very important to, to have a rifle that's very comfortable to you for several reasons. Uh, one, you're going to be more accurate. Two, you're going to just want to shoot it more. Um, and, you know, being a rifle that you want to shoot, just... You know, by nature, you're, you're going to shoot it more, get better with it, know it in and out. So, you know, I think uh, comfort, comfort is certainly a very important aspect in firearms, too. Shout out to Brett for being my first commenter. And shout out to Jerry for being the first subscriber. Well, that's about it, guys. Again, if you have any questions, concerns, if you're having any more teething issues, go ahead and post them below, and hopefully we can help you out. So, well, happy troubleshooting and happy building. We'll see you next time. I have to go to Home Depot.